it's Ivy Slater, and you're listening to Her Success Story Podcast, a show where gutsy businesswomen share their success journey. Hi, it's Ivy Slater. Welcome to today's episode of Her Success Story. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Kristen Borneo. And Kristen and I were connected, and I always give a reference of relationships because I'm such a strong believer of relationships. Through somebody I met years ago, a PR person who we had a mutual client together, we stayed in touch, who said, Ivy, I think you'd love a conversation with Kristen. She's dynamic. I know you raised your kids in the city, in New York City, in the schools, and you're all about families and education. You're going to love to hear what Kristen is doing um, and the organization that she has built. I can read her whole bio, and I'm going to skip that and actually get it out of the mouths of. <sighs> Kristen, welcome. Share with us, um, come say hello. Share with us a little bit about your organization and how this all got started for you. Um, well, thanks for having me today, Ivy. Um, so CT3 is the organization that I co-founded and now lead. Um, we got started out of, quite honestly, necessity. Um, when I was a principal and an area superintendent in East Palo Alto in Oakland, California, I just recognized that teachers deserve stronger and better supports um, and real-time feedback, um, as did leaders for that matter. Um, we have the, some of the most important jobs of the world of helping to raise tomorrow's future um, and waiting years for teachers to get really great at their craft just seemed like, oh, a huge waste of time um, because every teacher comes to uh, their profession with the heart and the need and the, the thirst to do the very best that they can for youth. Um, and oftentimes teachers struggle in order to get there. And it's a struggle that those of us who have been able to research or study or have more time in organizations, we can share our um, abilities and we can coach and we can support them in real-time structures so that it takes weeks or months instead of years to really perfect our practice. So CT3 really focuses in on uh, real-time feedback for teachers and leaders and to typically historically marginalized schools, but in uh, public schools all over the country. So you, you, you started in the school system, mm -hmm. you became a principal, became administrator in, in district, and you saw this need. Yes. Now there's a lot of people, and let's, let's be honest here, and that's what I believe in. There's a lot of people who see there's a hole, or there's, there's a need, there's an opportunity, and then there's the people who actually say, wow, I'm gonna go and fill that. Mm -hmm. sure. What motivated you to actually take that action? Um, well, I was a young principal. I think I took my first principalship at age 26. And so it wasn't my that first. That is young. Years. Yeah, it was young. Um, and so uh, I, my, my first few years of being a principal, I thought I had to know all of the answers. And as I approached my early 30s, I recognized like, whoa, like that's not my best way to lead. Um, and I don't have to know all of the answers. Um, I have all of these amazing people around me, uh, teacher leaders, special educators, regular educators. Like, why am I not utilizing and lifting them up being as leaders as, as well? And at times I was, I just wasn't doing it to the, to the rate I could have probably. Um, but it was as I started to reflect that I had teachers with great heart and the right mindsets that they wanted to do better for and with kids. They just didn't have the skills. And as an administrator, that was something that was missing in me in order to build them. And so I, I don't know if it was my mother or my father, but, or the two of them together, but they instilled in us is that you don't get to have complaints unless you offer solutions. I love um, that. You don't get to have complaints unless you offer solutions. Unless you offer solutions, which is Too the way that I lead to the today. parents. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's how I still lead today. Um, but um, so if I was going to have this complaint or, you know, notice a deficit that I brought or an opportunity that I brought to the table, then I had to think about something to fill in um, or that deficit. And so first I turned to other experts and to be perfectly frank, it just it kept falling flat on their face. You know, they kept falling flat on their face, frankly, with the, with the teachers that I was serving and the youth and the communities that I was serving. A lot of the work that we brought in um, to the historically marginalized and urban communities that I served was, made, was really created around middle-class youth. 
And so there were parts of it that could really work, but the uniqueness and the resiliency and the opportunities and the cultural differences um, in the communities that I served were, were blind spots for a lot of these experts. And so recognizing that some of it was working, but much of it wasn't, was then an opportunity to go out and start researching. Um, and so at the time I was just finishing up my doctoral work at Berkeley. And so I was a pretty well-trained researcher at this time. I collaborated with Lee Cantor, who was a, a well sought after um, professional developer at the time. And we went out to like really restudy some of the work that he had done and that I was trying to achieve in some of the highest performing urban schools with some of the highest performing teachers and leaders. And so all of our work is really just taking and codifying practices of high performers or what, what I call outlying teachers and who the students that we interviewed um, really coined the, coined the phrase, they're no-nonsense nurturers. And so the, the students really labeled our work, which is called no-nonsense nurturing. And um, yeah, so we support teachers with what that kind of classroom management and pedagogy could and should look like in your classrooms to serve all students, but especially those who have been historically mar marginalized in our schools. So um, it went from an idea to having a reach across the United States. That's a great, yeah, it was, and that was by accident. I did not, when I went out to solve this problem, I was really trying to solve the problem as a principal. Now I was, I had gone from East Palo Alto to Oakland and I was trying to solve the, you know, um, making sure that I was being the best support I could be for my teachers now in Oakland. And then I moved into an area superintendent's role. So I had more principals, more teachers that I was responsible for. And as we continued to train um, folks in uh, real-time teacher coaching and these pedagogical models, uh, other organizations started paying attention. They're like, well, we want that. We want that. Um, and I had more than a full-time job. So I um, eventually just had to make the decision to spin off uh, to a new organization and start running a new organization. So we did that in 2008. Um, and since then have been, you know, just rapidly growing um, and supporting more and more schools across the country. Um, I wrote a book even just a couple of years ago. We've had online courses for years, but finally put out the book, um, Every Student Every Day, A No-Nonsense Nurtures Approach. Um, to reaching all learners. So that's been helpful to help teachers that might not have access to our professional development. Um, and then the online courses are another way that if uh, your district or organization isn't investing in our coaching models, uh, which are kind of the gold standard of supporting um, teachers and leaders, I would think, uh, there are other ways that folks can access that. So we've been really trying to think about how can we give everyone access um, to different levels of our training. But it was, again, just to solve a problem that I had. And then the folks coming and saying, hey, can you teach me how to do that too? And the answers were always yes, but it takes quite a bit of time. So eventually we just had to spin off into our own organization. And so you've been around 12 or so years now. Yep. yep exactly. And going strong. Yes, so far so good. <laughs> um, so are you, uh, do the schools themselves reach out to you? Do the districts reach out to you? Do the cities reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? What does this look like? It's a great question. Um, most of our new work comes to us through referrals. Um, a deputy superintendent or a superintendent or a director of professional development will be working with um, someone in another district and they'll be talking about, you know, who are their strongest partners. Um, and a lot of times uh, introductions are made about our work then. Our work is not for the faint of heart. We really go in and work with teachers on their mindsets and belief systems around the youth that they serve. So it's really built on lessons of cultural competency and um, teachers relating and supporting and building life altering relationships with their, with their students. Um, and so it, this isn't work that all districts are ready for yet. And we recognize that. So a lot of times this referral system is really helpful. Um, the book has been really helpful in supporting and, and, and getting interest in, you know, in other folks. Um, and then some conferences were often invited to, you know, present at conferences yeah. about these unique types of coaching models um, and, uh, you know, how we're pulling things out of other industries into education in order to support what is very, you know, education is unique in so very many ways. But one of the things I think that we're really helping to shift as an organization that's beyond our scope is the culture of coaching and education. You know, in, in, in many other industries, you know you've made it when you've gotten an executive coach, right? You hit that VP level and now you get an executive coach. It's like, oh, I've made it. Well, in education, we've always looked at coaching um, through a deficit lens. It's the new or the struggling that get coaching. 
And so at CT3, we're also really trying to support that everyone deserves coaching and especially those top performers. Because if you coach your top performers, then then they're also a better, it trickles down. Exactly. It's the trickle down effect. It's a trickle down effect. And it's so true because um, in the work as a coach for myself for over many years, um, I have turned down when they say, oh, will you come in and coach this person? They're having, you know, we, we have, we'd like, because we're having problems with them versus we'd like to develop them further. I prefer to develop up and let that trickle down versus fix a hole that goes nowhere. We do both because you also have to remember at CT3, um, we're also very invested in every teacher. So there's a lot of new or struggling teachers that have the right heart, the right mind, and they're going to impact at least 20 to 30 students every year. So what we try to think about our coaching models is is coaching the top performers, the middle perform, the aspiring performers, which are getting ready to become the mentor teachers. And then those new that are struggling because, and it's different coaching models and different, slightly different protocols even as to how you engage with them, but they're all important part and part important parts of the system because they're all impacting youth every year. And oftentimes the will and the motivation there is very high. Teachers don't go into teaching to, to, you know, manage classrooms or to have to overthink, um, you know, their pedagogy. That's what they love. They have a love for content, a love for kids, a love for teaching, a love for knowledge. And so we want to let them access that and bring that, you know, inspired uh, feeling to all of their students. And so that's really what we're, we're supposed to do. And, and it, I love your approach of reaching them at all levels, because the more you can go in and infiltrate, so to speak, and educate and educate from the top, the middle, as well as the bottom tiers, they meet and the entire area blossoms. Yes. You know, it's, it's kind of a little bit like you think about planting a garden um, and, and, you know, it's love my gardens. But if you think about planting a garden, you want some shrubs, you want some perennials and you still want those annuals. You want that balance, that mix. Well, and I think something that applies to other industries as well, uh, you know, outside of education, you know, we started working with teachers directly and it became a real aha moment. Um, one of the CEOs we were working with knew my work and she, she was like, Kristen, <laughs> your strength has always been in developing leaders. Why aren't you coaching leaders? She's like, that's the linchpin of every school building. And, um, uh, you know, I really took that to heart. So eventually we developed our leadership protocols. And what that also helps to do is if the leader's being coached, it gives everyone else permission also to be coached. Um, And folks are always, you know, will often ask me at conferences, Dr. Barrero, why, you know, tell me about you. And, And they're surprised to hear that I have an executive coach. I lead a coaching organization. Of course I have an executive coach. Um, You know, because it's something that we asked, why do coaches have coaches? Just like the greatest athletes in the world, they're the greatest athletes because they're the coaches and they have some of the best coaches. Um, But so of course I lead a coaching organization. Of course I'm going to have an executive coach. And there are times where, you know, I'll talk to my coach and he will say something to me that I have just coached a different superintendent on, but you, you can't do that for yourself. Like you need the outside perspective. Um, and that's really now, important. I think I, I huge nail on head, head because they're like, well, Ivy, if you're a business coach, why would you hire a business coach? I said, because I would spend all my days coaching my clients and helping them build their businesses and never give a second thought. Although I know I'm supposed to, Right. to my own, mm-hmm. unless somebody holds my feet to the fire because I have that huge open heart and we show up for others that we forget to do for ourselves. So all great coaches need somebody to call them out and not just call them out, but help them look at their own perspective in that mirror of you. That accountability that you're talking to about coaching is so, so important um, because I think accountability is often done better by relationship and by uh, respect rather than positional power. And so that's the other thing we're trying to develop in organizations is, you know, a great coach is somebody that's respected and trusted by their mentee or their coachee, right? It's not about their positional power of having coach or principal or director or superintendent. 
that's, that's not what helps you to get into people's hearing oftentimes. It's how they respect you, how they trust you. Um, and I have to be honest, I think women bring like that transparency, that compassion, that need, you know, that interest to lean in and pull everyone together and see the best in folks that can really be upheld and lifted, not only just in coaching platforms, but also in education in general. So tell me, you know, uh, you're in your 12th year of business and 2020, we got some curveballs yes. thrown our way. To say you, the know, least. Um, you know, you had a, a great business plan. You're working with a coach. You have, you know, you're a leadership person. You have a plan going in. You have contracts. You have X, Y, and Z going on. What, ha- what adjustments have you made to the to the business model, as well Mm -hmm. as to meet your clients with their changing world in education. I think before we talk about the business model and clients, you've got to talk about your internal culture first. Um, Great. And so the first thing that I did, um, when all of this hit, I was actually abroad and it was very difficult to like to be 17 hours ahead and trying to manage it. Um, But it also gave me some time to really reflect on how I wanted to handle the pandemic um, that was approaching us. And what I did was I coined the term circuit breakers and I gave the, you know, I, I named what we were going to lead with at CT3. We're going to lead with our people in mind first, um, our mission um, second, um, because our people invoke our mission. Our mission is critically important, but without the people supporting the mission, the mission's no good. Um, And then we were going to support our clients. Um, And so thinking about our internal folks was really important. And so I, I, I let them know how we were going to lead through each decision. And then um, we gave them circuit breakers. And so we had four or five different circuit breakers that were very well laid out. As the explain, pandemic, explain a little bit to our listeners what you mean by a circuit breaker. A circuit breaker, a circuit breaker was if this happens, then this, will, this is how our business will shift. If this happens, then this is how it will affect our employees. Um, and so, so laying out different case scenarios. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and then, and letting your, your, your people, your culture, your team know that you've already planned, if A, we go to B, if N, we go to, you know, if it's exactly. M, we go to N, if it's P, we go to Q, right? Exactly. And just being really clear too, because from time to t- the first three circuit breakers we were able to hold on to really well, but the later ones, as the pandemic kept shifting, we would, we'd also have to then communicate, this is how the circuit breaker is going to need to shift. Or we've been really strong in implementing from circuit breaker three. So now circuit breaker four can be a little bit more of an ease. And so just continually communicating um, in both reading and writing um, so people can read it as well as um, uh, hear it, you know, so doing our Zooms and those types of things has been critically important. And the other thing I've recognized is, I've, I always say as a leader, Folks need to hear something 17 times in order to really internalize it. So you want to repeat messages. And just because you're living in that space as a leader doesn't mean all of your other folks are, right? They're out do, doing the work, the, the great work that you're supposed to do. During a pandemic, they need to hear, hear it probably twice that amount of times because you're dealing with you know, f- family issues that you normally don't have. You're dealing with you know, the shelter in place and how that is... is um, supporting you emotionally. And then we're in the service industry where we're supporting leaders to and through this pandemic. And so there are also, many of our um, employees are taking on a lot of the emotional stressors of that. And so being really clear around how many times people need to hear things, making them feel as secure and safe as possible, but also being transparent around, this is how it's going to affect our business. And this is how it might inflect our, you know, how we are as employees or our retirement funds or whatever that ends up being for you but being as transparent as possible and as soon as possible. Because the other thing you don't want to do is communicate so early when you're still modeling. Um, And so you've got to get the models pretty, you know, really strong so that you have confidence in them as well um, in order to communicate them. But I think, you know, being transparent, communicating in multiple different ways is really helpful to and through a pandemic. Um, And then our folks have been able to go out there and help other leaders to do exactly that. Right. And I think, um, Uh, One of the things I talk about is one of the top, top, top components of great leadership is communication. And I love what you're saying. And I am highlighting it for a really strong reason. Listeners, 
is what Kristen is saying. She goes, she put it in writing and she communicated it verbally and she did it 17 times and then 17 wasn't enough. So let's go for 20 and continuing for people because especially in a uncertain time, in an unexpected, when we're living with uh, things ever evolving and we're working differently, we are hearing things we're not always opened in our regular environment to hear. Mm -hmm. So we hear it differently. And so by repeating and reiterating the message in various ways, we're giving our people, our community, our teams, an opportunity to hear clearly where they're coming from. I think the other important part of that, that communication too is uh, we, do f we started with Monday morning all team check-ins and we move those to Friday afternoons eventually. Um, so we could do, do some celebrations if we had harder news to deliver than people had the weekend, um, you know, to kind of think about that. Um, my cell phone's always open to all of our employees. And so if they're struggling with something, my, my whole thing with them is, is if you're going to bed worried about something, call me. I don't want you, I don't want it to keep you up at night. 15 minute call for me, if it'll save you sleep, like let's chat. Um, and I'm on the West coast and many of them are on the East coast. So I'm not going to be sleeping yet, folks. Like you're, you're good. To, you're good to go. Um, I think that's really important. But then also during those chats, always leaving an amount of time for folks to ask questions. And I try to say, if you're going to ask a question, make sure it's for the good of the all, not just personal to you. Um, and so sometimes if they're more personal to them, like I'll say, you know, Hey, I'm going to take this offline with you. Um, either I'll answer that or our chief operations officer, or chief program officer, I'll answer that. If it's good for the all, then answering it with the all can be really important because then new questions will pop up and that will also help as you can communicate transparent, transparently, particularly in any situation, but particularly in a, a situation like this of the pandemic. I think it just grounds people more. They feel better taken care of. Um, that transparency, that trust, that respect isn't going to just happen now, but it's going to carry you to and through your business and ground people even more in, you know, their belief in, your, in, in you as a leader and your organization and in the mission that you're trying to serve. And it's interesting you share that because it brings me back to thinking of all the years that I have been through various education programs, watching my kids be educated and having all those parent-teacher conferences is the encouragement when you have a question, don't sit on it, ask it. Right. Because it Absolutely. can benefit all. And that's the crux of, you know, being a great pupil and Absolutely. to be a great leader, you're always a pupil. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what has surprised you for, for in building this, in building CT, CT3? Oh, surprises. <laughs> there's, I'm sure there's just maybe one. <laughs> uh, just one. It's interesting. You, you asked that question, it's really hard um, to, to answer because I, th I feel like I get surprised. I don't get surprised often. Um, I would say um, I'm pretty good at, at thinking about how, keeping my pulse on what are happening and, and what's happening in the world and what it, in the world of education, not in the world in general, in the world of education and how I think people will react to certain news and stuff like that. So the pandemic has been a little bit surprising on, um, I have to be honest, it's the communication part of this, how many leaders that we're supporting are supporting the, the right now communication, but not going back and rebuilding context and talking about them in the future. And I think that's really important. Um, and I've seen leaders- Share a little are, bit more about that and how so you do that. I'll, 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 I'll just use in my space because you know a superintendent would be the equivalent to a CEO or an executive yep. director in a not-for-profit or something like that. But I see a lot of superintendents right now um, and they're doing such amazing work and they're working around the clock but they're talking about what we're going to do today and tomorrow or last week and into next week. But they're forgetting to communicate all of the things that they've done up until this point to set the context as to why we are here today. And then saying, based on what we see going on now and in the future, this is how we're planning on reopening school. This is subject to change, but this is what it looks like today. And so there, I, I'm finding that community, those leaders that are doing that and doing that well, um, people are like their communities are standing behind them. They're super excited. They're able to ground in some level of truth and they're able to ground in, in a common message. When that's not there, that's where you're seeing 
some upheavals. And I think this could be true for governors or what have you as well. You know, this um, is true for business. This is true. For everything. What you're talking about is a rinse and repeat, whether you're looking at education, whether you're looking at fortune 500 companies, whether you're looking at small business, a rinse and repeat. I love that. I had never thought of that term. I'm going to use it. Thank you for that. Ivy. Um, but I think, you know, you have to keep bringing people back, particularly during times when they're anxious, right? Mm -hmm. So outside of a pandemic, people are anxious if your stock's going down, right? So you have to talk about what got us here, what we're doing about it, what the future is going to look like. And you need to talk about that transparently. So it's not just about in a pandemic, it's about any time. And when times are great too, communicating those types of things can be incredibly important. So people know how to repeat it. What's yep. the context that got us here? How are we operating within this context? And what does the future look like in order to, you know, have the heyday last as long as possible? And so that rinse and repeat, I'm going to use that um, time and time again now, that rinse and repeat messaging is always important, but particularly right now. So that's what surprised me is I've seen some really great communicators struggle with their communication to and through this pandemic. And I think it's because none of us has been trained to lead through something like this, right? And so great leaders that are really taking the time to think and um, not react, but be pensive about what's happening um, are really showing up in much different ways um, than fo folks that are really good leaders um, that are forgetting some of their basic skills because it's, it's hard. Leadership is hard, it's difficult. Um, and that's why there's so few of us, right? Um, and I certainly am not doing everything right and well all the time. Um, I love that all, so all, all of our employees at CT3 are leaders, right? They're former principals, superintendents, you know, so they're all leaders in their own right. And so anybody will tell you leading a group of leaders is very interesting. So they're always coaching me on, Hey, Kristen, you're missing the mark on this. Or, Hey, Kristen, you coached me on this last week. Why aren't you doing this? And I'm like, Hey, give it back to me. Like they keep they keep, you know, and, and I think that's, that is a form of building a great team mm. and a great organization. Cause I know, um, in, and I've always led if it's later success or when I had my printing company back in the day for 20 some odd years, my people will call me out. Yeah. And I invite, I don't just welcome it. I invite I them to, to because yes. I know then we're all showing up for the best of our organization. Yeah. Folks have often struggled coming to CT3 because one of the first things I'll tell them is like, you get, you've earned your seat at the table. Congratulations. Now in order to keep it, you just got to make all of us smarter and in particular me, meaning you have to challenge me. Like, and you don't have to do that in your one, but you have to get there. You have to challenge me. And folks are like, what is happening? But then they'll see other folks do it and how I react and so it becomes a part of the culture, but there's so few cultures that are like that. Um, because I say it, because I'm the CEO, does not make it gospel, folks. It means it's the first idea out there. Our jo your job is then to make it better, massage it, and then put it back um, out for, our, you know, for the people that we support. Um, and be clear, not all the first ideas come from me either. They come from everywhere. But mm -hmm. the key is, is that, yes, the key is, is that we've got to, you know, really create a culture that folks feel like their voices are, that their voices matter. So listeners, for those of you who could not stop writing down these tips, could not, and it doesn't matter if you're in education, if you're a CEO, a budding CEO, running any organization from managing partner to anything, these, we talked today about real leadership and Kristen has made a huge difference in the leadership space that affect our children, our leaders of tomorrow. And for that, I thank you personally. Um, how can our listeners know more about you, about CT3 and continue to follow you? Oh, well, that's great. Um, so I'm, uh, my Twitter is at KKB underscore CT3. Um, my name is Kristen Clyberero. I wrote the book, Every Student Every Day. Um, a no-nonsense nurture approach to all learners. And our website is ct3education.com. That's ct, the number three, education.com. Um, and you can get my email address right on the website. Feel free to reach out if there's anything that we can do to support you. Or if you're in other industries and you're interested in learning more about our real-time feedback and how we do that, happy to support other industries as well. And, you know, taking this work and supporting other fields. Awesome. 
Uh, listeners, everything is in the show notes below. And, and I'm just going to throw out a suggestion right now for all those people who we know who are amazing teachers, a little thank you gift to them could be Christ, uh, Kristen's book. It's a little something to say thank you for the teachers who are really showing up 100% for our Leaders for Tomorrow. And in all kinds of ways, this has been a huge adventure for not just the children, but for the teachers who make a huge impact on their futures. So, you, um, that, you know, just a little something, because I'm, I'm thinking my niece, you know, my niece is a teacher. This one I know is a teacher. That one's a teacher. And it's like, wow, you know, little gifts go a long way when you think of people. Especially for teachers. They appreciate every little thing. Yeah. So thanks for joining us here today, listeners. Remember, as you look at those show notes to connect with Kristen, reach out and hit subscribe. And we come into your inbox every Monday with new, fresh content, interviews, and pieces of information, as well as please feel free to leave your biggest takeaway in the, in the box below. Let us know what impacted you so we can better serve our community. Kristen, thanks for joining me here today at Her Success Story. Thanks so much, Ivy. Have a great day. Approval anymore, cause I've got mine.